Deborah, just there again last month. They say up to 90% of the downtown is going to be demolished, including Christchurch Cathedral. Half of many of the neighborhoods has been leveled. But there, in the middle of all this devastation, these vacant lots, the community's coming together to do remarkable projects. They, there's, they're, they're bringing back that spirit of community. So downtown, they've lost a major hotel. And community members said, we need a place to gather, a place to have concerts again. All they had were a bunch of old construction <coughs> pallets. So they created the Blue Pallet Pavilion. And I was there opening day, all built by neighbors. <laughs> oh, it's a greenery, and it's just so creative. This was another vacant lot. Somebody had an old washing machine. So they put speakers on the inside of the washing machine. And if you put in quarters, you can hook up your iPod and then uh, play whatever dance music you want. <laughs> and so here people are in the middle of all this devastation, dancing and celebrating. This was another vacant lot. And so they painted a movie screen on the side of the wall. And, they, uh, and you pull your bicycle up and you hook it up to a generator, and as long as you're pedaling, you can watch the movie. <laughs> it's called Cycle Power Cinema. Just incredible creativity coming out of community. This is another vacant lot where they painted the wall so people could write poetry. And they do poetry readings there. And this poem in particular really got to me. Amidst the shards of glass and twists of steel, beside the fallen brick and scattered concrete, we began to understand that there is beauty in the broken. Strangers do not live here anymore. So powerful. Through that experience of the earthquake, they came to realize that there was nothing more important than their relationships with one another. And too often we realize it when it's too late. I did a workshop for the people of Christ Church, and the MP was there, and she, she came to visit us in Seattle afterwards. And she said, Jim, you know, we're often taught that to prepare for emergencies, we need to gather emergency supplies, and that's important. But there's nothing more important than just knowing your neighbors, being connected. Here's some other unique powers of community, the power to promote health. There are studies that show that about 15% of health outcomes can actually be attributed to healthcare professionals. In many ways, our communities can have a much bigger impact on our health, on our personal behaviors, on our mental health, on the social, economic, physical conditions, environmental conditions that impact our health, economic conditions. Creating great places, instilling happiness, social justice. We know no major social change has ever come top down. In my country, the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, the disability rights movement, the gay lesbian rights movement, the environmental movement, the anti-war movement, every major change has come bottom up. So without strong communities, we can't make change. And our very democracy is dependent on strong communities. The problem is, at the, most time, at the time we most need our community, our communities themselves are in the greatest state of crisis. How many of you know Robert Putnam's work? professor at Harvard University, wrote the most depressing book you can imagine for those of us who believe that community is important. Wrote a book called Bowling Alone. And he used the bowling team as the metaphor for the incredible breakdown of community life in North America over the past 50 years. Talks about how fewer and fewer people belong to the traditional associations like bowling leagues and rotary and elks and lions, and all those animal groups. <laughs> How fewer and fewer families are eating dinner together. How fewer and fewer people are voting. And he cites a number of reasons. I've added a lot of my own. So one reason is single purpose land use. It used to be that we live, learn, work, play, all in the same town, in the same neighborhood. And now increasingly we're creating single purpose places. Bedroom communities where we just go to sleep. Then we may drive a half hour to the mall to shop. We may commute an hour to work. We might drive our kids a half hour to the, to the recreation complex. 
And in many ways, we have many different communities, but in a sense, we have no community at all because we don't bump into the same people over and over and over again. And it used to be generation after generation after generation, our families would live in the same village. How many people here have moved more than five times over the course of your life? And for a lot of you, it's a lot more than that. And if you're always on the move, it's hard to build relationships, and that's what community's all about. And if you know you're just going to move again, why bother? It's a lot of work. Longer work days, more and more people in the workforce, more women in the workforce. Great thing that women have always been the volunteer leaders in our communities. Less time to be involved in community. Fear. Fear has been documented as the key thing breaking down community in many neighborhoods. Whether or not people have a reason to be afraid, they're living behind closed doors. And the more they're behind closed doors and don't know their neighbors, the more fearful they become. Fear of the unknown. Robert Putnam said the biggest thing breaking down community is television. People say they don't have time for community, and yet they spend an average of three or four hours a day in front of the television set. He wrote this book a while back, so I think now he would add all those other electronic screens, <laughs> the one-way screen. I just uh, spoke at a wellness conference in Banff, and a researcher reported that young people are spending an average of 11 to 12 hours a day in front of screens of all types. And social media can be a great thing to reinforce personal connections. It just can't be a substitute. Increasing globalization, where decisions and products are made further and further away from where we live. And perhaps the most damning, specialization and professionalization, where the very agencies that are trying to help our communities are inadvertently contributing to their breakdown. Where we have more and more professionals doing for communities what they used to do better for themselves. And one of the strengths of agencies is that they're organized into silos with a laser-like focus on their discipline. Narrow focus. But it makes it absolutely impossible to build community, work with community. So our agencies have separated the young people from the old people, from the people with disabilities, and you can't build community in silos. Who's serving whom? Our communities are having to organize themselves the way our agencies are organized. We need to get our agencies to organize themselves in more of a place space kind of way, a cross agency. So I've totally depressed everybody. <laughs> Talked about how important community is and it's going to hell. And I'm going to further depress you because I got, this sort of illustrates to me what's going on. This is another house in our Ballard neighborhood. A little house, a woman who lived in here is 85 years old. She'd lived in this house most of her life. The developer owned the property around her and said, I'd like to buy your house so I can put in a new development. She said, I'm not selling. She said, but I'll give you a million dollars for that house. Her house is worth $150,000. She said, I'm still not selling. My community is worth more to me than a million dollars. She was an absolute hero in her neighborhood. How did the developer respond? <laughs> A little extreme, but you know, <laughs> the noise. that is how so many people experience community these days. So many people are feeling powerless in the places where they live. That the future of their places is not being shaped by the residents, but it's being shaped by outside money and outside decision makers. And how in places where there's even still a strong sense of community, there are individuals everywhere who feel disconnected who feel isolated, who don't feel a part of community. But I'm a hopeful guy, so I want to share some of the lessons I've learned about how to rebuild.